let me tell you about Jeanette. Those who don't know Jeanette, she's basically the face of our board. I thought you were the face. No, I'm the president. <laughs> you are the face. <laughs> <laughs> when, yeah, when you see Jeanette, you know it's the board. And I bow to her because she keeps us together. She definitely keeps us together. And starting tomorrow, today, tomorrow, March 1st, mm -hmm. no, not tomorrow, mm -hmm. Jeanette is our new chairman of the board. She was vice president for 10 years. And rightly so, she should be in this high position. And I know. Okay. It's true. Everybody knows that knows Jeanette that she holds us together. She's our My group. face is going to be. So she is our new chairman of the board. She's also keeping all of the programming. Um, and we're really excited to see where she's going to take us going forward. She's also the organizer of the North Tonawanda Library Genea Genealogy Club, a member of APG and the National Genealogical Society. I think I got it all in. Let's do that. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, out of curiosity, how many people were here in January when I did um, a similar to this on Ancestry? Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, Family Search is such a huge website. It, it was diffi it's difficult to pack all of its features into one hour. So I'm obviously not going to hit everything. And because most of us are Ancestry users, um, I took the approach on this as comparing Family Search to Ancestry. Because if you're used to a feature that Ancestry has, I'll show you its equivalent on Family Search. Um, out of curiosity, how many people have a Family Search account? Oh, yes, okay, this is awesome, awesome. Um, while you're sitting there, uh, how many of you have downloaded the Family Search app to your mobile device? If you have the time, because you have a tree, go ahead, the um, library has Wi-Fi, you could download that app. We're going to do a little bit something later in the presentation. Um, so if you could please do that and then log into that app while you're there. It's optional. Okay. Um, so this site is just an amazing site. Um, and I've been working on this presentation for a couple months now. And I just want to say, of course, you know, I was taking screenshots as I went along. They've updated their site slightly. So a button might be in a little bit of a different area than where it is. The button's still there, but some of my images are slightly outdated um, as they just are constantly changing um, the look of their site all the time. So, getting started. There are four big genealogy giants that everyone talks about. In fact, um, just the latest issue of Family Tree Magazine has an article by Sunny Jane Morton um, comparing the four genealogy giants, which are Ancestry, Family Search, My Heritage, and Find My Past, which I had to change this slide last night because Find My Past just changed their logo Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's happening right now because Roots Tech is um, going on, and Roots Tech is the largest genealogy conference um, in the world, and it's happening today. Um, it started on uh, Wednesday. Um, in Utah right now at Salt Lake City. So the differences with these is that this. <laughs> um, three of the four genealogy giants are subscription based. Okay, they, you um, pay a membership fee and um, certain ones have different levels of membership. Um, almost all of them you can upload a certain amount of a free tree um, and then you get to a point where you need to start paying for membership in order to um, connect to documents or anything like that. The one that is not a membership-based website is Family Search, and that is what we are going to be learning about today because it's free, which is amazing. <laughs> so, looking at the changes, there are the differences between the two. As I said, I was going to compare Ancestry to Family Search. Ancestry just announced that they have now have over 24 billion records. Last year at this time it was 20 billion. They've, <laughs> they've updated to 24 billion records. Family Search has 4 billion. And you might be like, oh, well, well, that's kind of small. 4 billion, okay? <laughs> yes, it might be small in comparison to Ancestry, but 4 billion free records is amazing. 
Um, and so one thing to keep in mind too is that some of Ancestry's 24 billion records are indexes of the documents that are at FamilySearch. Last month when I was talking um, for our two programs there, we were looking at the Ancestry um, one and there was an index and I added this document, it was a hint on my family tree, but it was only an index and it referenced the Family History Library film number. And then um, if you go over to Family Search, you put in the film number, there's the original document. And we all learned last month about the genealogical curve standard and how we want to go find those original documents anytime we can because they're more likely um, to not be as error prone as something that has been transcribed or indexed. On YouTube, if you like watching videos, a YouTube channel that you might want to subscribe to is called Genealogy TV. Again, on YouTube, that is Genealogy TV. She publishes um, genealogy videos every couple days. And one of them she did, um, I think it was back in May, it was called The Inside Scoop about FamilySearch.org. And she did an hour-long interview with one of their employees. And that employee in that um, interview said that less than 10% of family searches in ancestries or any of those large genealogy giants overlap. They all have unique content. And if only 10% overlap, therefore 90% of each of their databases are unique to them. So that 10% uh, overlap tends to be census records, um, you know, those big common things that we're all going after. But then think about all the unique ones that they have um, off in their own. So you don't want to just play in one sandbox. You want to go and check out all the sandboxes to see what cool collections that they might have there. Last year, 1.8 billion records were added to Ancestry. Family Search adds about 350 to 500 million images each year. So everybody's trucking along and more and more and more documents are there. So if you thought, oh, I checked that website a couple of years ago, I didn't have you know, my family on there, it just wasn't there, go back and check again <laughs> because they're adding stuff all the time. Um, and so you need to, you need to check that out. Also, Ancestry talked about in this article that they have 11 billion names extracted from records. Family Search says they have 7 billion searchable names in their records. Pretty good. Again, in this article, Ancestry is a company. It has enough records to offer separate subscriptions to the US, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Mexico, Sweden, and the UK. You know how we're Ancestry.com, but then right over Canada, they're Ancestry.ca, because they have separate subscriptions. And so their focus is, I gotta have enough records to keep those people buying my subscription in this area. So they're focused on what is going to make me the subscription money. Whereas Family Search being free to everyone, they don't have to market to subscribers. And so they prioritize records that are at risk for loss. They go to places where books are falling apart because they haven't been archived. Um, I listened to one podcast and the guy was talking about how he walked into this room, I think it was in Africa, and how the, the pages, he thought he was standing in sand it was all the pages of the brittle paper breaking. So Family Search is trying to go and save those records that are going to be lost that no one else is necessarily going after. Um, so in order to look at these records on Family Search, you need to create a free account. Many of you already said you had one. Great. No big deal to do so. You have to put in your name and email address. If you need someone to talk you through it, just recently, I think it was last week, another place on YouTube that you might want to subscribe to, um, this gentleman, uh, his channel is DNA Family Trees. He's been posting videos a, a few a week 
And right now he's going through like a beginner series on ancestry and family search and things like that. And he has a video called Growing Our, Our Tree on Ancestry.com and an introduction to FamilySearch.org. And it, he talks you through the process, how do you create an account on Family Search? So if you're not familiar with that, go check that out. DNA Family Trees on YouTube. So we wanted to go check out some of these 4 billion records at Family Search once we've created our account. At the top, you're going to see a menu, um, Family Search, and then there's Family Tree, Search, Memories, Indexing, and Activities. Right under Search, we want to Search Records. And you're going to come to this main search page. And it's kind of divided to the left side and the right side. On the left side, you'll see search the historical records. And this is where you can do a global search and put in a person's name. On the right, some options are research by location and research into individual collections. We'll look at those in a minute. I want to start back over here with searching the historical <coughs> records. Um, so you add in some info of an ancestor. I just randomly picked Barney or he went by Bar Barna, I think Barney was his nickname. I put in his name and where he was, and they come back with 2,807 search results um, of things that they have in those four billion records. If you're not finding exactly what you're looking for at first, on the left-hand pane, you can narrow down the search results, just like on Ancestry. You can pick some places. You can add the name of a spouse. Um, if you scroll down, you can even um, narrow by, you know, birth year. If we look at this, there were nine records for Barna Whitakers that were born in the 1700s, but there were 668 records for Barna Whitakers that were born in the 1800s, or it's very similar search to Barna Whitaker. You can also filter by collections. This was kind of a neat button. And then when you click into that, you'd be like, look, do you want to see just results for birth, marriages, and death? Or do you want to see results that are in censuses? And then you can check mark which ones you would like to narrow the 2,800 results down to. Here's the thing, though. When you're searching in this manner, you're not getting all of the results from the records that FamilySearch has. So let me take you through a little bit of history of their records. Okay, Family Search started off as the Genealogical Society of Utah and was established in 1894. And they've been going out collecting records for 100 years. They started microfilming records in 1938. Since then, they have collected 2.4 million rolls of microfilm genealogical records, 1 million microfiche, and hundreds of thousands of books and periodicals and everything else. Um, so they store this massive collection in a granite mountain vault in Utah for safekeeping. And then they keep copies of those at their family history library, which is in Salt Lake City. So here's Barbara and I. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> we took a trip to Salt Lake a couple summers ago. Um, the, their library there was opened in 1985. And when you walk in, there's many different floors. Out of curiosity, who else has been to the library in Salt Lake City? Just Barbara and I? It's super fun. <laughs> you have to go. Um, so on the third floor is their US and Canada um, floor. Then the second floor is their US and Canada film. So the third floor is the books. Then the main um, level is their discovery center. The basement one is their international level. And then basement two is where they have Australia, British Isles, and New, New Zealand. So I took a few pictures while I was there showing the microfilms that they have. Now this is one aisle and one floor. Look at that. Look at how long it is. That's just one aisle. <laughs> okay. Of which there were many aisles and on one floor. <laughs> and then you open up a drawer. Look at all those films in one drawer, in one aisle, of the many aisles on one floor. <laughs> and no space is wasted, because if you can't get to those, they turn them on and you can get the, the films that way. And if you think about all the names of the people in one record on one film in the whole drawer, and you start to multiply it, it just blows your mind how many records that they have available. Because more than one book can fit on a microfilm. 
you know, so they could they could go to your church and you know microfilm uh, make digital copy or images of three books that fit on one microfilm, and within those books there's thousands of names. So how they used to do it was not everyone could get to Salt Lake to look at these microfilms. So for a small fee, they would make a copy of the film, and you could borrow it, and they would send that copy to a local family history center near you. Um, one of the ones that we have near us is on Maple Road. This is at 1424 Maple Road in Williamsville. Has anyone been to that one? Yeah, isn't that? They're so nice there. They have wonderful hours. They're open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays, 10 to 2, and Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 to 9. Um, so you would pay the small fee, they would send the film to you for short term or long term, when you were done with it, then it would go back. Um, if, if it was long term, it would stay there. However, <coughs> microfilm as a media was becoming outdated. And so they already, as they were collecting new material, they were doing it digitally. They weren't doing it on microfilm anymore. But they were still buying microfilm to make copies to send to everyone. And on one podcast that I listened to when they were interviewing a Family Search employee, he said that the company that they were buying their microfilm blanks from kind of approached them and said, listen, we don't want to do this anymore. Um, I can't remember if they said we wanted to retire or like you guys are our only business and we, you know, we, we want to get out of this. And so Family Search went, okay we got to take a step back and decide what we're going to do. And so um, they decided they weren't going to make copies of their microfilm anymore to send out. They were going to discontinue the lending process and that they were going to digitize everything and put everything up online. It was going to take them three to four years to do so. They announced this in 2017, so we're getting pretty close to where they're finished with the project. So this is great. We can start researching for a home, and you don't have to pay the, the plane ticket to go to Utah, which is nice, although it's super fun. You should really go. <laughs> um, so the problem is, is they're digitizing all this stuff like that, but they're not indexed yet. Oh, there we go. So what do I mean by that? Here's an image that I saved from the microfilm when Barbara and I went to Utah. So this is one page out of a book of baptism records. Um, and I think just kind of by counting the boxes, there was 13 children that were baptized. And so there's one name. Well, the, but also on that record was their parents' names. And in this, um, this priest in particular wrote the grandparents' names <laughs> um, in it with maiden names, by the way. Mwah. Okay. <laughs> it lists the names of the godparents, the date of birth, the day of baptism, the religion, wow. the legitimacy, the occupations. I mean, there was awesome stuff on this. And the images are there, but it's not searchable because it's an image. This is not something that is text that a computer can simply OCR, that optical character recognition. I mean, they're working on handwriting type of stuff, but um, you know, this type of thing where there's water damage, you know, in order for it to be searchable, it's going to take a person to read the document, abstract you know, the names, transcribe it, and in this case, translate you know, in order to create a searchable index. So, Ancestry has paid employees that they index everything. And I think I saw in one of Krista Cowan's videos, she said that Ancestry rarely publishes anything that isn't indexed. You know, like, is the when it's up there, it's either already been indexed and named searchable, or if not, it's done shortly thereafter. But on Family Search, they really rely on volunteers to help do some of that indexing. So they've got all of these imaged records up there, and they're sitting there, but we need to go and read them. So uh, at Family Search across the top, one of the menus is an indexing button. And um, so when you're logged in, then you can click on Find a Project. One of the ones that are going on right now um, was in conjunction with the New York GNB, Genealogical and Biographical Society, our state um, genealogy society, where we are now indexing the grantor and grantees um, for the um, New York state land, land records. Um, and so when I did a talk on this back in October, um, this was only at 5% done. Now, a couple months later, we're at 57%. So 
they often say, pick a collection that's in your area because we're probably more familiar with those names. And, um, you know, like I saw, I did one that was for New Fame and to see Jayquish, you know, like that's a local name that we're familiar with, where if the, somebody else was looking at the cursive, they might go, wait, I'm not sure how to spell that. You know, we're familiar with those names. So pick collections that are you're familiar with and how you do it, it's super easy. It's all on the web. Um, and so you look at the image, you can blow it up real close. Um, this was for Landings and Cataraugus in our Western New York kind of area. And you just kind of enter in what you saw on the page. And when you're done, they give you confetti. <laughs> so you're like, yay, I did a good job. <laughs> and so um, now that I have typed in all those names on the, that image, the next time one of you guys go to search, it might come back. And so they sent an email earlier this month to all the indexers saying thank you. And they said in 2019, 124 million records were indexed um, and 145 million were re reviewed by thousands of volunteers like yourself. And so in October, they added this new feature to Family Search that when you're looking at something, you might see a little button comes up that says, this was an indexed record. Um, a volunteer indexed this record for you, and you can thank the volunteer. And you just click on that, pops up a little thing. It's already like written out for you, you know, like or but you can customize it, and then you can just send them a little message, you know, and say thank you. You helped me find great great grandma. You know, kind of neat. So back to searching. I took a little <laughs> little swing, but um, we had looked at on the left on how to search the historical records. But on the right, you can also research by location. If you kind of, I want to search within a certain area. So you can click on the map. The map is click, clickable. And you, know, you can click on United States, and you can narrow down to New York. And it brings you to this page. This is like their kind of New York home base page. And it's got all of their collections that they have. It's got learning center content, which we'll talk about later, um, links to their wiki. I actually don't use this page as much as I should on um, where I tend to go. And it's not that this is a bad page. It's just sometimes you get into your habits <laughs> on where to go find your records. And this just isn't my path, but this is a good one. You know, please don't discount it. Where I tend to go is here. Um, underneath the map is a link to browse all published collections. And this is where I just tend to go. And so right now, Family Search has 2,716 collections. Um, and you know, an example would, of a collection would be like the 1900 census. Or shown here um, is the Alabama deaths 1908 to 1974. So they have all these different collections. So it could be multiple books within one collection. You know, they kind of put things together in a bow. This is searchable, so if you don't want to go scrolling through all 2,700 records, um, you can type in the name of one. On the left-hand pane, you can narrow down where and when. Um, I only want to see you know, records in the United States, or I only want to see records in Canada, and I only want to see records that take place in the 1800s type of thing. On the right-hand side, you can see the record counts, how big you know, how many names are within that collection. And then you can also click on, you can look at when it was last updated. Because they might have a collection that's only 50% done, and as they keep adding to it, then they'll add updates to it. And you can sort that if you click that, and then it'll, um, it'll bring all of the newest ones up to the top. You know, so if you're checking to see out, like, oh, I haven't, you know, I haven't checked Family Search in a week, I wonder what they've added this week. You can just click on that last updated and check that. So narrowing down to New York State, New York State has 58 collections in it. Um, you can look at the records column, you'll see a number. And this is, you know, as I said, the number of records within that collection. If we look at the second one down, um, this is the New York State book indexes to passenger list, 1906 to 1942. There's 15 million names. 15 million records within that collection. But notice on the left-hand side, there's a little camera icon. We love the camera icon. That means there's images, finding the original records, the genealogical. Okay. <laughs> and so um, you definitely want to look for those uh, camera icons. 
If you wanted to go in and search at this, you know, because it's been indexed, you can put in a person's name. Or at the bottom, if you did want to browse through the images individually because your ancestor's name wasn't coming up, you can choose to search through all 748,000 images. Um, looking at the next one down, this is New York's deaths and births, 1795 to 1952. There are um, 222,000 um, names in that, which they have indexed, but notice there's no camera icon. They do not have images for this. This is simply an index. It's a good clue, knowing then that there's a record out there that you can then go try to find the original. The next one down is one of my favorites, the New York land records. Now this one you're going to notice, it doesn't have a record count. There is a camera, so there are images, but it says browse the images. These haven't been indexed yet. These you have to go in and um, just as if you're taking a book off the shelf and turning the pages, you have to go through each one. And um, I think it was last spring or something, we have a YouTube channel for Niagara County Genealogical Society. Subscribe to us, please. Um, I did a program on land records, and in that program, it's on YouTube, I show you how to go through that collection and how to use the indexes within that collection to find your ancestors' land records. Okay, so something that both Ancestry and Family Search have in common is they both have a card catalog. To find it on Family Search, you go to Search and you drop down to the catalog section. So we have been in the search records, so now we're down a little bit to searching the catalog. It defaults by searching by place. And by the way, earlier when I showed you at the very beginning how um, ancestry was going to a film, this is where you can put in that film number. Like, so if you come across a document on ancestry that's just an index and it's referencing a FHL, like a Family History Library film number, go to the card catalog and right there where the green arrow is pointing, um, finding the film, you know, find by the film number, that's how you do it. So you can put in the film number there. But, that's a side note. Searching by place is one of my favorite things to do when I'm searching within the card catalog. So, um, you start typing in, and when you do, a drop down underneath the box just starts to populate where they think you're choosing. On Family Search, they tend to go big to little United States, New York, Niagara. So, don't get throw off, thrown off if you're going Niagara County, New York, United States, and you know. Um, whatever it is, select the thing that pops up underneath the search box. You want to select that and then hit search. And you, yeah, they've got a few records for Niagara County. I mean, like I had to make it super small in order to show the whole list. But just a tip too, just don't search by county. Narrow it down even more. You know, they have, I just put a couple examples, they have documents for Lockport. They have documents for North Tonawanda. So narrow down your search result, you know, start globally, narrow in, try both. Looking at some of the results for Niagara County, um, there were four of them underneath the category of cemeteries. I went, um, you know, looking at the first three, there's authors, so those tended to be books. I wasn't interested in the books, but clicking on the fourth one, this um, what was called Vital Record Card Index of Niagara County, New York. I thought that sounded interesting. So I clicked on it. That brings it to this page, and it talks about how there were eight microfilms. That, um, this, these were filmed at the Niagara Falls Public Library in 1985, and that they were cards extracted from all these various newspapers. And you can see Buffalo Courier, um, the Daily Gazette, the Iris of Niagara Falls, the Niagara City Herald, Niagara Falls Gazette, so apparently librarians or the historian involved with the Niagara Falls Public Library, when they were getting the papers, they were extracting information from them and they made a card file. And then in 1985, they made an agreement with Family Search to have that card file microfilmed. And here's the microfilms. So it was such a big collection, when they were taking the pictures, it took them eight microfilm rolls to get all of it down. And so you can see each one, and um, they did it alphabetically. The first one was um, the names from Louis Albanilla to George Carter. And if you go on the far right and click on the camera icon, it brings you right into the images. 
And so on the, um, you can see the main layout here. On the left, I'm sorry, this particular microfilm has 5,162 images on it. These haven't been indexed yet. Okay, and so on the left you can see the plus and minus. You can click on any of those and zoom into it. So if I click on one, here's um, a microfilm image of the card that was taken from the Niagara Falls Public Library. And so you, know, you can clearly see it was, this was a birth notice for Mr. and Mrs. Bernard Acheson. Acheson. Um, and it was October 8th, 1929, page 10, column 1, son. Now, whoever abstracted this didn't tell us what newspaper they got that out of, but if you're, if you're wondering, you know, I got um, a baby in the 1930 census that is in the Bernard Aitchison family, and that they were about two months old, now I know that, you know, they were born October 8th, and you can correlate, you know, put those two pieces together to help you and know that somewhere in Western New York, there was a birth and notice in a newspaper. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. While you're here, you can download that image. <laughs> you can save it. This is free. <coughs> free. <laughs> okay. And what I, you know, tend to do, is, um, you can also attach it to your family tree to that person on Family Search. You can download it, and I'll show you an image later. Upload it to. Ancestry, save it to your files, you know, whatever you choose to do. Um, occasionally, occasionally, as you're going through the micro, um, I'm sorry, the card catalog, um, you might see a magnifying glass. That just means that the um, that particular microfilm has been indexed, so it's searchable by name. You might also see an image of a microfilm, and so that means a couple things that it either hasn't been digitized yet. Remember that they're they're projecting to be done in twenty by twenty twenty one. So they might not have gotten to it yet, or it's possible that they have digitized it. And then this one they have. If it's been given a DGS number, a digital number, um, is shown uh, to the right of the film number. That means it has been digitized. So why can't I view it, Family Search? Well, here's the thing: when they went out. And they said, hey, can I microfilm your stuff? And they did this agreement back in 1938. Internet wasn't even like a, a glimpse of an idea that this was a possibility. So when you said, yes, you can copy my records, you didn't necessarily give me permission to publish it online. And so they've been going back to everyone and say, hey, remember that document you gave to me 80 years ago? Can I put it online? And maybe they're having trouble tracking you down. Maybe you, you said no. I, I only want you to have it on microfilm. I don't want you to have it on the internet. Um, you know, there could be various reasons. Or it could be that um, privacy laws are now in place. And if that film has birth records, um, and you know how in New York you have to be um, 75 years to get someone's birth record and you have to prove that they're deceased? What if there's birth records on that film? And so due to privacy, Family Search cannot release that information. This is why Barbara and I had to go to Salt Lake City, um, because the film I wanted had been digitized, but the rights to it weren't released. And so, honestly, I was looking for an excuse. Um, so I guess, darn, I'm going to have to go to Salt Lake to look at that <laughs> film, you know, but um, that's, that's why. So there might be some reasons why you might see a microfilm image. You might also come across a, um, the camera image, meaning there's images, but there's a key above it. And when you click on it, then you can't see the images. That means that you either have to be logged in as a member of the church, or you have to be viewing the images at the Family History Center or a library affiliate. Because whoever I got those documents from said, yeah, sure, you can put them online, but I don't want it like online, online for everyone. Um, I want it kind of controlled. So if you could just... Um, limit it to um, being accessible in certain places, then I'm okay with that. So you have to go find a Family History Center or library affiliate. But don't worry, because we're a Warren! Yay! <laughs> um, this past fall, we announced that our library has become a library affiliate uh, to Family Search. So all of those little lock things are unlocked if you are at our library. And we, so we have access I'm not even kidding, to 400 million more records 
in our library than you do at home, have at home. 400 yeah. million <laughs> of those little locked things are unlocked. So come see us. Here's our library. <laughs> um, we're at 215 Niagara Street. We're open Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 1 to 445. Um, we're on the second floor of the Historical Society building. And I, I know it works on our computer. I'm fairly certain if you're on our Wi-Fi, you can use your own device, your own laptop, or you know whatever. And um, if you're on Family Search and you go to the card catalog, those little locks won't be there if you um, are visiting our library. Yes. Don't you have to use your computer at the library though to get on that? It's 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 we have a. Um, oh okay. I think through our I tested it through oh, our Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay. Because because it's connected to our static IP address, and okay. so that's that's how they do it. Oh, so right. as long as you're on our Wi-Fi, you should be able to access it we, we on our own device. It, we? Seems to me we checked it. I think so too. It's just I didn't check it this week, and my memory's not what it. Yeah, I didn't think it used a mine yeah. when I was there. Yeah. Okay. You can. So, awesome. If you're wondering where family history <laughs> um, centers and libraries are. Family Search has, you know, you can do a Google search like Family Search near me, you know, or whatever. And so we're one of two library affiliates in Niagara County. The other is the Lewiston Public Library. Um, and then you might see, so we are the um, orange ones. The little blue ones are Family History Centers, like the one on Maple Road that I mentioned. Any questions so far on what we've gone over? We're good? Okay. So next thing we're going to talk about family trees. So Ancestry and Family Search both have trees, but they have two completely different types of trees. On Ancestry, you have individual tree. It is my tree, and I may or may not give you the right if I choose to make you a guest or a you know, contributor to it. Um, Family Search has one global tree. They want to have one profile card for every individual that's lived on this planet and connect them together. And so I'm curious because I know a lot of people have opinions about this. How many people have um, a, a tree on Ancestry? Okay, what do you like about having a tree on Ancestry? Seriously, like what, what do you like about it? That it's, that it's your own tree? What are things that, yeah, might- Nobody else can change. Nobody can make changes to it. Anything else that you, you prefer about that? Maybe, you know, you have, because you have the ownership, you can take, you can delete it if you want. You can make it private. Barbara, did you have something? Yeah, and I don't know if it's just me, but because it's the first one I've done, it's user-friendly. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What do you I think, think more comfortable with it. Since you have the tree maker, so you can keep your hard copy at home. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 If you didn't hear, um, you can sync your ancestry tree to software like Family Tree Maker or Roots Magic and make a backup of the tree. Um, what are some, knowing that Family Search is a global tree, what are some cons to having your own tree on ancestry? Yeah, Barbara? Some uh, people will change your information or attach wrong people. Well, that's a con of Family Search. I guess I was oh, looking yeah, for sorry. a con of yeah. ancestry. Price. Price. Subscription. You know, not everyone can look at your tree and all the work that you're doing on Ancestry. Um, you know, if, if they think it's a paid site, you know, like you can send them a guest type of thing, but they have to still create an account, you know, that type of thing. Now, knowing that Family Search is one global tree, if you start building your tree, it's not too long before you connect to someone that's already in the tree. You might connect by your grandparents, your great grandparents, you know, because everyone's been working on this for years. And Family Search has been adding, you know, making profiles based off of people and records that they find. You can, you know, connect on. So, what are some benefits of having a global tree, of having a one tree? I need a connection. I don't know how it's connected yet, but they had some wrong information on there on my husband's side. They had uh, his oldest brother died when he was a year and a half. And they had his birthday, but they had him died in 1950-something. So I sent her a message and asked her to please correct it with his correct name and date of birth, and she corrected it. Yeah, so, so being I able to collaborate, I think mm -hmm. that's one of the neatest things, too, because oftentimes, 
Do you feel like you're your own little genealogy island because your immediate family doesn't necessarily care so much about the graveyard that you just found? <laughs> um, this, uh, these are people, these are cousins. I always use the example of Plinko from the Price is Right, you know, where you put something at the top. You know, so if you have an ancestral you know, couple and then they had kids, they had kids, they had kids, it all is trickling down you know, various ways. And so you know, one person might have inherited some pictures and you might have inherited some documents and this person might have her inherited something else, you know, an artifact of some kind. But you don't know each other. We're too far removed. But if if all of a sudden you know, you're working together on a common tree, we might start collaborating and, and adding, you know, if that person added pictures of, you know, copies of their photos and I added the documents that I have and somebody else took pictures of the artifacts that they inherited, you start to fill in that story and color that, that ancestor. And so I think that's a super big benefit. And then a negative to having the One Global Tree, Barbara had already mentioned, and you kind of did too, about how somebody might get it wrong. And there's various levels of, um, how do I put it? You might be more familiar with that branch than they are because you're closer to it, or you might have more experience. And so, but any of us can make edits. And so if you contacted the person to make a change, but you could have made the change, you know, because we're working on one tree together. So, you know, like you could make an edit, and when you do, then you add your reasoning why. You know, you say, this is the death date of this person, and I know this because I have the death certificate. You know, and you save, you save the change, and then upload the death certificate to prove your point. You know, and that way, the other people won't argue it after that. So there's, there's definitely benefits to me. I also keep in mind of longevity. Um, Ancestry is a company. What if on Monday they decide, we just don't feel like doing this anymore? <laughs> and you know, whereas FamilySearch is a nonprofit, you know, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Put your trees on both to help preserve all the work you've done and everything, the money that you spent gathering documents and the time and your stories. Put them on both. You know, try to spread it so that it, it'll help it, you know, live longer. To get to the tree on Family Search, just up at the top, you know, um, Family Tree, go to Tree. And it, you know, kind of defaults to a landscape, but there's a couple um, other options you can do. My personal favorite, love this, is that they have a fan chart. So here's my, um, my Family Tree in a fan chart, and you can see that it's got different levels of generations, how big you would like that fan chart to be. This is four generations. Here's five, six, seven. And these are printable, downloadable, you can you know, do whatever you want with them. You can also see um, that there's other options. Now that's just looking at my tree. You can also select things like birth country, sources, stories, photos, and um, research help. So here's birth countries, which they colorize. Mm -hmm. And so you can see all the people in my tree that were born in the United States, the ones born in Poland, Ireland, <coughs> Canada, Germany, United Kingdom. The ones that aren't colored are unknown. This is a great visual, I love this one. You can look at sources. So the darker it is, the more records you have attached to that person. So if you're like, well, I've got an hour, you know, what can I do? And so you could look at your fan chart and go, gosh, I don't have any sources attached to this person. Why don't I go and work on that person and see if I can't make that white color a little darker orange. And then the best is when it's the dark dark orange. <laughs> you know, like work towards that. Stories. There's an um, area in here where we, um, we'll talk about stories. And um, so you can see, I don't have very many stories attached to my tree. A lot of mine's white, and I have some in the light orange area, um, you know, that's showing I have one to four stories. And I'm sorry, the color isn't that good. And I have tried, that's as clear as we can make the document. I'm sorry about that, the projection. Um, the next one are re um, photos. Now, I've been pretty good about uploading photos um, to 
um, my tree. And so I've got a lot of dark oranges. And I don't feel too bad about the, the people out like five, six, seven generations away because that was before photography. <laughs> you know, so you can't be too hard on yourself. And there are people that will upload pictures just to have a picture, like if it's a person that was a May, you know, Mayflower to upload an image of a pilgrim. Personally, I'm not into that. Just leave it be, you know, okay? Um, and then lastly, research helps. Um, if you have any data problems, it would be bright orange. Luckily, I did not. Um, meaning, like, maybe um, you have the birth of a child after the death of a mother, you know, kind of thing, things like that. Um, record hints we'll talk about, and then research suggestions. Like, hey, you don't have a death date for this person. You want to try to find one? Or we don't know the country where this person was born. Why don't you look for that? Um, so that's what those research suggestions are. Both websites have profile pages for those individuals. You know, we're real familiar with the profile page on Ancestry. That's where I kind of always am working. Well, there's a profile page on FamilySearch, too. And so if you're looking at card for one across the top, just like how Ancestry does, you know, where Ancestry has facts, you know, and um, gallery and th hints like that. For um, Family Search, they have details, timeline, sources, collaborate, and memories um, right there. To the right um, are record hints, but right above that, there's this neat feature um, where you can watch a person. If you select the star, because it's a collaborative tree. And if you're curious, like you're uploading, you can, this is my favorite ancestor, and I want to know the second somebody makes a change to it, you can collect the star, and then Family Search will send you an email, say, hey, so-and-so made changes. Maybe they uploaded photos, or maybe they attached some new documents, you know, or maybe they changed a, a vital record um, date or place. So that's kind of a really cool feature. If you scroll down on the profile page, you're going to see um, relationships to the person. On the left are the spouses and children. Because we're looking at Elizabeth's profile card, you'll see that she's slightly shaded because she's the person of importance. Um, next to her is her spouse. And above it is a little plus. If she was married more than once, you can add more than one spouse. And then below are her children, of which one we have listed. On the right-hand side are the parents and siblings. You can see her father, but we don't have a mother for her yet. And then below are all the children of Patrick and the unknown wife, of which there were six. And you'll notice that Elizabeth is listed in there twice. I kind of like this, because when you click on siblings in, on an ancestry profile page, you don't know where your ancestor is within the birth order. Here it's showing Elizabeth twice, and she's shaded twice, so I can see where she fell within her brothers and sisters of being born. You're going to notice after each name, there's an, a code. This is an ID number that is provided to each person in the tree. Everybody has their own unique ID. This way, if you have uploaded some, and I've uploaded some, and we, we're related and we accidentally uploaded, um, we made uh, two cards for the same person, we can then review that and merge those into one. You know, so that we don't have duplicate people on the tree. Um, so these ID numbers are important to keep in mind, especially if you're looking around and you come across something that you think might be a duplicate of your person. So Felix and Elizabeth had more than just one daughter. If we go to um, add another one, beneath Elizabeth, you'll see add a child right there. And so it brings up this window. And so you add the name of the person. Um, if they're male or female, if they're living or deceased, that's very important because if a person is living, um, they're going to be protected. You cannot see living people on the global family tree. Um, and if their person is deceased, they're saying, hey, add some information because who knows, maybe we already have a card for that person on the global family tree. So when I put in Margaret, it said, no match down. We don't have anyone that's named Margaret McGinnity with these type of dates in the tree. So let's just create a new person. And so you would click on create person. And there we go. We've added Margaret as a child to Felix and Elizabeth. I'm going to go on and keep adding all of the children that they had. And so this is a different family. But it won't be too long as you're adding. 
that you're going to try to add a person and it's going to be like, hey, maybe we already have someone in the tree. So here, here's what you added on the left. You entered James Warboys, that he was born about 1867 in New York. He died January 6, 1942 in Batavia. We have somebody named James Warboys that was born in March of 1868. That's really close to where you said. But um, he was born in, in England. So what do you think? Do you want to create your own James Warboys? Because you know there can be people that can have the same name in the world. Or is this your guy? And you can add that match. Now obviously we would not want to add the James Warboys in England because our guy was born in New York. And so we would want to create the new person. We wouldn't want to add the match. Oops, there. Okay, so um, I mentioned a little bit about record hints. Both companies have hinting features on Ancestry. You know, we, last month we worked on their, their hints, or you know, they used to be shaky leaf hints. Um, Family Search has record hints. You can see the icon there. Um, if any of you um, might be like, hey, I got an extra 40 or $50 and I really love web watching webinars, May I suggest getting a subscription to Legacy Family Tree webinars? They have over 1,000 webinars on there. And even if you don't want the subscription, many of them are free. And you can register for ones that are happening now. And then you have one week to watch it afterwards. Um, so, but there is one on there. Um, by actually, funny enough, our friend Sunny that wrote the article in here, she did one this past July called Should You Take the Hint? And it's um, automated record hinting on the genealogy um, giant websites. And since July, it's had over 8,000 views. Okay, so this is a wonderful webinar. You know, if you're like, my gosh, I, 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 I want to add the hints, I'm nervous about it, she'll talk you through all of it on Ancestry, Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. So that's at Legacy Family Tree webinar. So, Record hints on Family Search are on the person's profile page. They're to the right. And if you click on one, it'll pop up a little window, and you can scroll within that window and um, you know, see, see if you think it matches. And then you can say, you know, do you want to review and attach, or do you want to, you know, you can see from the, in, the information abstracted that is not a match. But wait. There's an image. It's an, there's an original image. So before you attach it, before you review it, before you say no, following the genealogical truth standard, we are going to look at that image. You can click on it. You're not going to break it. The hint's not going to go away. Click on the image. And when you do, you know, it's similar to the ones we were looking at before. You can blow it up. You can look at it big. Um, you can. You know, make sure that, yes, this is my family. You can download the image, just like we were looking at the um, Niagara Falls cards. You can download it, save it to your computer. You can upload it to your ancestry tree in the gallery if you want. Okay? Once you're sure that that is your person, then yes, click Review and Attach. And it's going to bring you up to this menu. So on the left-hand side is the document. On the right-hand side is your family tree. And they're putting them side to side to compare. And so you say, yes, this is her. I want to add it. Um, and so you put a little reasoning. This is a record search because she was listed as the mother of her son on her son's death certificate. So I just put, this is a death certificate for Ivo McGinnity, and this matches the family. And I attach it to her because she's listed as the mother. Then you'll see, because I was dead, her husband Phoenix, or Felix is also there, you can click compare and attach the document to him. And so that opens that up. The reason is already in there, and then you just hit attach. And then we have one more person to attach it to, because it's Ivo, it's his death certificate, we should add it to Ivo. And so you click on compare for Ivo, and the reasoning just stays the same, and you attach. If by some reason you accidentally attach a document, this is you can just detach it right there. And then when you're done, you just click on return to the family tree. Okay. Are we good? Is that good? Mm -hmm. Yes, any mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. Awesome? Mm -hmm. Okay. You guys are doing awesome. This was a big one with lots of slides. <laughs> um, so 
comparing our two um, websites, Ancestry has a gallery, Family Search, they call their gallery memories. Um, and one thing that Ancestry does, if you upload a lot to your gallery, is it just mixes it all together. There's pictures, documents, census images, it's all kind of mixed together. I kind of, if I, you know, there's so much I love about Ancestry. Please don't think I don't love Ancestry, but if my, one of my favorite things is Family Search is this memories area. And one of the reasons is because it divides it into four different categories and kind of organizes them better. So at first, it has an area for just your photos. So you can upload photos to that. Then there's documents, so it kind of separates them out, you know, so they're not all mixed in. Then there's an area for stories, and then an area for audio. So there's four different ones. You can't, I don't believe you can upload audio to Ancestry. And with Ancestry within their gallery, with the stories, you typically have to type it out in like a Word document and upload it as a PDF. This opens up a window. You can type the story into it. So it's, you know, like, and you can edit it after the fact and things like that. So earlier I had mentioned about that there's a family search app. <coughs> One of the many webinars or whatever I've watched, they said that the app is 95% has the ability of the full website. <coughs> like their little app is really powerful. Um, and that they've done a lot of work behind the scenes to make their website mobile friendly. Um, and so you can uh, work really, you know, do a lot of your family search while you're waiting at the doctor's office, you know, like, and do stuff like that. Um, one of the neat things it has um, within the app by using GPS and things like that is they have this feature called Relatives Around Me. And what it does is it scans your family tree and my family tree, and it'll show if we're related to each other. Here's um, my cousin, Diana Fulton, and my other cousin, Nancy C uh, Caster. And she, uh, Nancy, is going to be our speaker in September, I think, on DNA. So you'll all get to meet her. But it'll also show people that you're not related to. Barbara and Joanne, I'm sorry. We are not cousins, <laughs> nor am I related to Diana's husband, Steve Fulton, who is our um, uh, friend from the Ontario Genealogical Society, um, who's out in Roots Tech having so much fun right now. Um, so they can show you that. So everyone that's got a family search right now, open up your app. So go to your app. Okay, click on your family tree app.
to our common ancestor. Never heard of him. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> down to Kristen. Isn't wow. that cool? Pretty slick. I love this. And so, Joanne, no, <laughs> sorry. Do you have a point where you're not going to somebody? I'm a big deal. No, <laughs> no once you, if you have, this. with these trees, um, you know, once you've gotten into it, I have deep um, American roots. And, and you know, I, I am in the Mayflower and things like that. And so once you kind of connect on, you're related to quite a few people, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that we would never know we're related. We probably share two centimorgans, <laughs> if that. Um, you know, so, but that's just a neat feature that the um, app has on it. That, you know, if you are having a big family reunion, um, you know, maybe that's a fun thing that you play, you know, with them. All right. So does that mean it's if you're a DNA relation or nope. just the tree? Just Paper tree. In a tree, so it's just made just be by marriage or. Um no, it I because it, it was showing to parents. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So any questions on that feature? Fine. I finally got it to work. Well, we're not related. Month, I'm not yeah. related to four people in here. <laughs> You're not related to four people? No. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, like there's there's a page that you can um, read, but you know, upload it. They say no, they say no, you know. But mostly it, it's fine. That was the only one that I've ever had a, an issue of. Mm, no, there was another one. I can't remember what it was. It was um, a bridal party, and something about the the dress length or something. I don't. There was something. Because um, she was sitting, I think the, the skirt had rode up a little, like it wasn't, I didn't notice it, but they want it to be clean. These are, you know, open to the public. So once it's done being screened, once the photo's approved, you'll just see this red exclamation point saying, hey, you need to tag the picture so we know who's in it. And so you go into your photos and um, it'll say, hey, click on the image to say where um, Uncle Dave is. And you can do that, you can add a title. Um, you can add a date when the picture, you know, like um, an event, place, stories about it, and then you're done. And so once you've tagged it to that person, you've given all the information, you know, he told me where it was taken and it said, according to Dave, the mini bike didn't have any brakes and his brother Jim took a wild ride. <laughs> um, and so you can tell a little story about, about the picture. This is one reason why I love it. And this is not exactly how it looks on the screen, but this is the best I could do to take a screenshot to kind of show you. The boxes sizes change. You can make them smaller. This, I just made them big so I could, as a demonstration. You can tag the people in group pictures on Family Search. On Ancestry, I can't tell you how many of my descriptions are like, left to right, so-and-so, so-and-so, this person's sitting on the lap, this person's kind of behind, it's, it's really difficult, but you can tag the, the faces, and you can make the boxes really small, or you can make them really big, you can size the boxes around um, in order to um, label the person in the picture. Love this, love this feature, one of my favorites. You can also do it with documents. Not every document is easy to read. <laughs> And um, as you do, you know, like this one, you can tag the people in the document. And so somebody else that's looking at this is going, holy cow, what is that language? I don't know what I'm looking at. The priest broke the name in half and kind of put the other one underneath. You know, so you can tag where in the document the names are. Love it. For memories, so we've looked at photos, documents. The next one down, I'm sorry, is stories. And in the stories area, you know, I would start putting my um, notes in. You know, I was talking to my grandma, tell me about Albert Parkin Sr. And she said that he came from Canada and he had lived in Hamilton with his uncle. You know, and I had written that down before she passed away. And then I talked to her brother, Uncle Lester. And he said Albert Sr. was from Canada. He went to Detroit. He met Julia in Detroit and got married there. And then Lester had also gone on to say Marianne and Albert Jr. were born in Depew, New York. Albert Sr. was a painter and a wallpaperer. And so you can add that in there. I could have made them separate stories, but I just kind of do it. You can edit it after the fact. But then as I began my research, I found out that Uncle Lester was wrong because I found the marriage certificate of where Albert Sr. and Julia got married in Buffalo. So I could have gone back and edited it, but I didn't want to change Uncle Lester's words. And I could have put it underneath, but I chose one neat thing is you can just leave a comment. Even though I'm the one that created the first post, I made a comment underneath. And I just said, I found the marriage certificate, and I should have been more specific. It might have been one of those late nights, you, you know, right? Like, when you're researching, when you should be sleeping. And I, I said, I found the marriage certificate, and they, I should have put Albert Sr. and Julia. They were, you know, but it was attached to their tree, so I'm just making an assumption. They were married in Buffalo, not Detroit. And I had uploaded that picture into, their, or into the documents. So that's a cool feature that you can do. All right, just a sec. Okay, so DNA. Here's one big difference between Ancestry and Family Search. Ancestry has DNA. They just announced they now have 16 million people that have spit into those into the tubes. Um, Family Search does not have DNA. I got to go to FGS this past um, summer, and they had a little "What's the story with um, Family Search and DNA?" session in their booth, and um, so they talked about. They're like, listen, they're like. So many companies have DNA, we're not going to start selling kits. 
you know, we, but we happily educate you on what to do, you know, if you are, if you've taken a DNA, DNA test somewhere. And so FamilySearch is not going to be doing DNA. And by the way, I posted that on our Niagara County um, Genealogical Society's blog. Like our blog. <laughs> Go to our website, click on blog, subscribe, that way you get all of our blog information. Um, look, comparing the two websites, Ancestry and FamilySearch both have areas where they have videos teaching you about things. Ancestry has Ancestry Academy, and then FamilySearch has what they call a learning center. Now, if, if Ancestry is 24 billion records and FamilySearch is 4 billion records, if you're compares, comparing the Ancestry Academy to the Learning Center and FamilySearch, the scale is way tipped the other way. Ancestry Academy has great videos on there, but it is a small library, and as far as I can tell, they're not adding to it. Mm. Family Search Learning Center, I can't even tell you, they must have thousands of videos for free on learning and all these topics, um, and they're adding all the time, all the time. So, you go to the Learning Center, and to do so, at the right where it says Help, you go down, Learning Center is the option to click on. And when you do, it starts with just a generic getting started in the search box. And so you can kind of see each of these are video lessons. You know, or some are audio, but most, most of them are video. And so if you were like, I'm a beginner, you could type in the word beginner and you'll see various topics come up. What if you're like, I have ancestors in Pennsylvania and I don't know how to research in Pennsylvania. They've got four videos on it for you. In fact, there's probably more that I just didn't um, take pictures of. What if you need to read a document in Latin? There's a couple classes on Latin. What if you have German and you want to learn how to research your German ancestors? There's videos. Go learn about it. They're free. What if you want Polish? Polish in here? Yay, okay. <laughs> um, you know, you can um, look at all these classes that they have. You know, they range anywhere from five minutes to an hour, you know, like different courses. Some of them have um, handouts that you can download that goes along with them. You know, what if you're like, okay, DNA, I, I've done it, now what? There's the whole video series on what to do with your DNA, all in the Learning Center. Um, I did a search for methodolo methodology, you know, then came up Danish land records, Norwegian military records. Research planning, getting paid for your passion, becoming a professional genealogist. There are videos on so many topics, you, you just don't even know. Type in a topic that you're interested in in the Learning Center and see what comes up. It's one of my favorite, favorite places. And then kind of coming to, a, you know, towards the end here, both websites have a, a support center type of thing. Ancestry, again, if they have all these records compared to Family Search, uh, this is another one where the tips are, where the scale is tipped. Ancestry Support Center, they have some guides. They're okay. They're not great. You go to the Family Search Research Wiki, oh my gosh. Okay, you have to go to the wiki. So, on the right hand side of your screen, under help, we have looked at the Learning Center. Down there is the research wiki. This is um, what Ancestry has for New York when I did a search in their help area. You know, and it's just kind of, there's a thing about finding immigrant records, managing sources and trees, finding information in newspapers. It's kind of all over. Just because it mentions the word New York isn't going to necessarily help me. When you go to the Family Search um, Research Wiki page, it says that they have 92,000 articles right now. We're all familiar with Wikipedia. This is a Wikipedia for genealogy, okay, within Family Search. And you can, on the left hand side, search for a topic, a place. Um, on the right hand side, you can click within the map and find the area. If I do a search for New York on this, it already starts populating some of the um, articles that they have. Well, are you interested in just New York United States genealogy? What about the New York Public Library? How about the New York military records? New York censuses? New York City? New York church records? These are all articles 
And their wiki articles, they have links in them that are current, that you can click, they'll take you to documents, you know, mm -hmm. um, to record collections. Okay, so this is the New York United States Genealogy page. I couldn't even do it justice the way it was on the screen. You know, like they've got so many different topics. Um, getting started with New York research. How to find the birth records in New York. Marriage, death, um, New York record finder. Uh, what were the boundary changes for New York counties? You know, all these different, they're all clickable. You can go and learn. Okay, scrolling down, they had a map. Is there a specific county you want to research in? They have a page for every single county in New York State. And then you click in that page, it'll give you the records. I think I'll show you the Niagara one in a second. If you scroll down a little bit, hey, do you want to learn about Niagara or New York migration routes? Um, you know, what about the Lake Erie? What about, you know, the, I'm sure the Erie Canal has to be in there somewhere. Um, you know, how about different um, resources? Hey, did you know that there's resources outside of our wiki? You can go to Cindy's List or Ancestor Hunt or Random Acts of Genealogical Kindness. These are all clickable links. Here's the um, place, you know, like you can either do place or topics. So looking at Niagara County, New York, they have a huge page on that. Um, and so if you're like, okay, I'm going on a research trip, I'm going to Orleans County, you know, which isn't far for us. But I don't know about Orleans County. Before you go, you have to research your area so that you don't waste people's time. So you get a plan going. You know, when did they keep birth records? So, you know, Niagara County, there's a description. Um, when did they start keeping records? What was their pa parent county? How about the boundary changes? Um, you know, did they have um, Bible records, biographies, cemeteries, censuses? These are all links. They even have what archives are in the area. We're listed, you know, as, as museums, libraries, societies within the, you know, within the county. There's just everything. So that's a little bit about the places. When you're in the research wiki, you can also do topics. And one of the most popular ones is looking at genealogical word lists. Okay, so, you know, a lot of us are dealing with, um, you know, other languages. So what if we wanted to look at the Italian genealogy word list? Because I'm looking at Italian records and I don't speak Italian. So they go in that wiki, they talk about the language characteristics. Wow. You know, how, how are genders done in their language? Plurals, verb tenses. They have keywords, you know, that you might see in genealogical documents. This is, you know, how to say the, um, how the days of the week look. Um, then they have just by the alphabet, all the words you might find by the letter that start with the letter A, start with letter B, start with letter C, start with letter D that I have up there. They also have another very popular topic within the research wiki, our letter writing guides. If you are trying to obtain a record from Poland or Czechoslovakia and you want to send it in their language but you don't know how, they have a list of all the countries that they have where they have the letters scripted for you. So let's look at the one for Russia. Okay, so this is our Russian letter guide. So it says you want to, your letter should include the date at the top, the uh, name and address of the addressee, a greeting, a brief introduction, biological information about your relative, a short specific genealogical request, referral request, a comment about payment, your closing remarks, your signature, your return address. Then they show you each part of the letter. They say, okay, here's your greeting. If you want to say, dear sir or madam, this is what it is in Russian. If you want to say, dear pastor, this is how you do it in Russian. And then they say, okay, I am researching my ancestors and need information from your records. Then that's what it is in Russian. <laughs> and so you can pick these sentences and form your letter to send to them. Um, you know, then they give all the examples of the words that you might need to use in your letter to request that document. Um, you know, and then at the bottom, you know, please send me a copy of the marriage record of this person, then it shows you it in Russian. It's just amazing. You know, to cover your expenses, I'm enclosing a donation. Things we would say in a genealogical letter. Just amazing. And if you want to learn more about the research wiki, um, a couple times I've already mentioned Roots Tech. Right now, um, the largest genealogical conference is going on in Utah, like today. <laughs> and um, it's called Roots Tech. 
there are free, they're streaming many of their free videos. Roots Tech is sponsored by Family Search, um, and so you go to rootstech.org, and when you do, you'll see at the top video archive, and you just go to free, you know, your free videos, and you'll find this one. This was just loaded uh, yesterday or the day before. Unlocking the power of the Family Search Wiki. You can learn all more about um, the Family Search Wiki there. Um, oh, right there. Free video archive. This is how you do it. They have videos all the way back, I think, to 2014 um, or 2016. No, I think 2014. You can't beat it. Absolutely free by the best speakers around. Um, on all of the um, topics. I was just, um, Barbara and I were talking about, I was listening to Judy Russell this morning talk about copyright while I was showering. I mean, like, this is, this is what we do. Um, and so go there, watch these videos. And that was 186 slides. So <laughs> I know I took, usually I try to go an hour 15, and I went a little long, but um, do you guys have any questions about family search? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, first of all, have they changed their way they format the family tree recently? How they, they, could they broke they broke it up or anything like that? <clears throat> Not that I've noticed. I mean, I've had a family search account for years, and I had quite a tree built. And then recently, like well, probably six months ago or so, I went in and when I click on my name, it only shows maybe three of those. But yet, if I click, if I search for one of my later ancestors, their tree will come up. And, but it does, it's disconnected, seems, it's disjointed. Yeah, so it it's, seems like somehow maybe a branch got disconnected from your tree. So find out where the disconnect is and then go to add a parent. And then it'll say, hey, in the tree, we think there's somebody already here with that info. And then just reconnect it. I've tried to send them a couple messages. But they I have an 800 if, number that's yeah, I don't know if they're not, if I'm not explaining it right or not, I understand. But they, you know, I haven't been able to fix the situation yet. So. Well, and you can, um, I, you can see me after, and we can set up a time where we can meet at our Niagara County Library, and I can sit with you okay. and go over it. Any other questions on Family Search? Yes? Um, getting access to the Saint, uh, Salt Lake City Library, do you have to be a member of, anybody can walk in yep. there and get yep. access to the library? Yep. Okay. Yes? How do you actually physically to, uh, put your tree from Family Search onto Ancestry. Is that possible? You can download, the, because this was a beginning session and I only had the hour 15 to kind of go over everything, I didn't go into much of like downloading. There are ways that you can download your portion of what you've entered from Family Search to your computer as a GEDCOM and upload it, but that would be a different class. And again, you could. <laughs> well, this was a beginner's, this was an introduction to, to family search. So, yeah, if you, again, if you want to see me after, we can sit down sometime and, and do it. And so, Jeanette, I got two stories I can tell real quick. Okay. Go back to the one that had New York State, your, your slide, just back off five or so, maybe 15. I don't know. <laughs> I had New York State. Yeah, no, that next one. Yeah, you see, uh, I used to live in Stark County until last year. And you see the, <coughs> when Pennsylvania and New York were negotiating on where the western boundary of western New York would be, they thought, Pennsylvania people thought, that it ended at the Niagara River because it was at the end of Lake Ontario. Well, Lake Ontario extends beyond the Niagara River, <coughs> and so Chautauqua County is now part of New York State, when Pennsylvania really thought that they were going to have a lot more access to Lake Erie and Dunkirk Harbor and all that because they were going to have Chautauqua County. The other true story I know from Albany is how did they set the international boundary on the Niagara River around Grand Island? <coughs> well, if you call Albany, if you're an official and you call Albany and say how did they set that boundary, they threw a whiskey barrel in the Niagara River. <laughs> and where it went, <laughs> set the international boundary. And that's what Albany will tell you now if you ask where the international boundary is. Uh, Niagara River, you can't. I have a family member who 
who was an official in Grand Island, so I know that a little bit. Thank you for sharing. So, so first, um, go ahead, Barbara, real quick. Uh, to, I was going to say, when I, I didn't choose to do a Gen Con to upload to Family Tree. Family, family search. search. I just typed in my immediate answers. I did too. I kind of viewed it as a do-over um, because it um, allowed me to review if what I had on my ancestry tree as I was putting it in a family search that I had done a good job back when when I had done it. They don't allow you, I was looking into it, you can't, if you've got like 17,000 people, you cannot upload a JEDCON like that to family search because um, they would, so, so many duplicates would be made. So you can upload it, it would be in the genealogies, and then after that, you can do small portions of like 100 people at a time and work through them, but you have to then look at each person, say where it connected in the family search tree, if it was a duplicate or not. Um, so it is, it is involved. Any other questions? Okay, so we have another program in an hour at 1 o'clock where Carol is going to be doing research, laws, and planning. So it gives you just enough time to go over to like scripts or um, bunch of crepes or I just brought a lunch if you want to sit here and eat with me or you could go to um, a penalty box, grab something to eat, then come back, you know, and, and see for our other program this afternoon at 1 o'clock. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.